Okay, thank you for joining us today for our Miller webinar, Best Practices for a Lab Setup. My name is Sandy Lau, I'm a scientist at Miller and a part-time research fellow at the University of Auckland. In today's webinar, we will cover some examples of lab setups that will hopefully help streamline your current lab for large-scale telemetry experiments. Firstly, a bit of housekeeping. All attendee microphones have been muted and will remain muted during the webinar. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, so feel free to uh, oh, feel free to send us your questions as the webinar progresses. You can do that by typing your questions in the questions panel down here. Uh, your questions panel may be collapsed and you can expand it by clicking on the expand symbol here. I've also put a handout for you to download. I'll talk about that later in the webinar, but you can find it in the handout panel here. It should download as soon as you click on the file. In this webinar, we will discuss a couple of practical considerations I think will help configure a lab to sail smoothly with chronic animal experiments. This webinar will not touch on any company or university policies, local ethics requirements, or any monetary values you might require to get things up and running. For that advice, you should really talk to someone within your own facility. I'm just going to show you how we set up our working space to maximize efficiency, especially when you're scaling up your telemetry setups. But before we get into the webinar, we'd like to find out a bit about how your lab runs. So I'm just going to start a poll now. And I'll leave the polls running for 30 seconds and share the results with everyone. What type of environment do you currently perform your recovery surgery in? Do you use a dedicated surgery room separate from the main lab? Does your facility have shared surgery bubbles that you use? Or do you use a dedicated surgery bench in the lab? Or do you hot seat lab benches with portable setups to use whichever one is free? So about half of you have voted at the moment. I'll just give an opportunity for um, others to do, uh, participate. And I'm just about to close the poll now and sharing the results with you. So it uh, looks like the majority of you use a dedicated surgery room. A few of you share surgery bubbles and a few of you use um, a dedicated lab bench. Moving on, so regardless of the type of surgical space you use, they usually contain these three areas. A pre-surgical preparation area for when you shave the animal, give injectable drugs such as pain relief and antibiotics. Now I use the term area loosely because this can just be a disposable incontinence sheet or a large piece of paper towel over the area you will perform surgery in, or it could be in a completely adjacent area. The reason I would put an incontinent sheet over the area is that when you shave fur off your animal, the fur is very difficult to get rid of, and if it sticks to your surgery area, it might be a potential source of bacterial infection. Now, bearing in mind if you do a lot of tandem surgeries or if there's surgery already happening while the next animal is being prepared, the preparation area where the animal is about to be anesthetized should really be away from the surgical space so the animal cannot see or smell its mate being operated on. Now, your dedicated surgery area should be non-porous, easy to clean, and disinfected every time before use as it helps minimize infection rates. A common example of um, a surgical surface is a stainless steel table. The post-surgical recovery area is where your animal will be held as the anesthetic wears off, and it should be a warm, dark, and quiet area. These environments help your animal make a speedy recovery from surgery, meaning you get your nice, stable baseline data faster. I'll show you a photo of this later. So this is the environment I do surgery in. 
I don't have a wide angle lens so I couldn't get the whole room in view but off the picture on the right here is the pre-surgical preparation area. The surgical area is in the middle and when the surgery is done um, there is a perspex box in, with a heating pad underneath uh, which is the post-surgical recovery area. So after the surgery I can turn off the light in this particular room whereas in the main animal room I can't adjust the lighting. If I'm doing multiple surgeries on the same day I'll put the first animal back into the animal housing room to recover with a heating pad underneath and a drape on top to keep the light out. Now although I call this a dedicated surgery room, you may do other manipulations on live animals such as ultrasounds or complete terminal experiments here, but all surgeries are done in this room and generally the room is off limits for making up chemicals or your histology or anything that will compromise the cleanliness of the area. Setups like these are great for many surgeries each week as everything you would need are in the same area. There's a, for example, there's a pulse oximeter um, and heart rate monitor. You've got your surgery light, your microscope, storage for sterile supplies, uh, and also where we keep our stereotactic frame, for example. Um, there's also a ventilator under the table here. Um, there's a heating pad for during surgery, there's oxygen supply comes from the wall and the scavenging unit is plugged into the wall um, and it's a very efficient setup for lots of surgeries. However, I'm very well aware that I'm very spoilt when it comes to equipment and laboratory space for surgeries. If you don't have the space to build a setup like this, or you don't do enough surgeries to justify this, there are other options. So surgery bubbles are similar to dedicated surgery rooms but with no walls. They are freestanding marquees inside large scale animal breeding or holding facilities. The one that I have worked in maintains a pressure gradient where the pressure inside the bubble is slightly higher than outside to help reduce microbe levels. Now being shared, they usually have a booking system and charges rent to cover the cost of maintenance. There may not be room to keep your consumables or equipment that you might need for your particular surgery, so you may need to set up and pack down after every surgery. Also being shared means that you really have to be careful about thoroughly cleaning the surgical working area before you use it to minimize any potential for infection. Finally, surgery bubbles may not come with a recovery area or if there are other bookings after your surgery, you won't be able to keep your animal in the recovery area in the surgical bubble. However, if your animal has a heating pad under the cage like this and or a warm heating disc in the cage, you can get these from pet stores um, and a drape over the top, it would be fine for the animal to go back into the holding area. Now we keep stressing the importance of keeping the animal in a post-surgical recovery area as their ability to regulate temperature is affected by the anesthetic. It puts a lot of stress on the animal to have to maintain the body temperature without external heating which can delay recovery from surgery. Now sharing surgery bubbles with other people can be inconvenient, especially if they're constantly booked and delays when you get to start your experiments. Another option is to set up a dedicated surgery bench in your lab. This option means you don't have to commit to maintaining a surgery room for occasional surgeries. Dedicated lab benches as surgery areas work best if you work in labs where you have separate rooms for each lab group and not so much when you have an open plan shared lab space that spans the length of the building. This is mainly because of disruption from foot traffic or microbes and particles in the air that can compromise the cleanliness of your environment. When you set up the space, make sure the bench is not near a door where there's a lot of foot traffic or it's not directly underneath air conditioning vents. Additionally, think 
carefully before holding consumables in the shelving above the surgery bench. You don't want to be doing surgery and then have a colleague reach over to grab a syringe from the shelving above to use for tissue culture or cell culture. How long has it been since that person have, has washed their lab coats? What could potentially be on there? Finally, these, are are, these areas are usually quite small, so you might not be able to fit in extensive surgery setups. For example, if you need to use a ventilator, a stereotactic frame, a light source, and a microscope for your surgery, it may be difficult fitting all this equipment in. Similarly, it would be difficult having multiple researchers working together in the setup or to try and train new staff. So here's a couple of examples of small surgical spaces. This photo shows an example of an area that can be used for a dedicated lab bench for surgery. And you can see the working space is actually not directly under these shelves, which may be accessed. Another example is this commercially available portable system, which has your gaseous anesthetic dispenser and a scavenging pump for use for uh, with carbon filters as well as a small workspace for surgery. It's something that you can fold away and put into storage when not needed. If you do a search online, there's a whole market available for benchtop surgical apparatus. So animal housing environments. It's very well documented that the that environmental cues such as light dark cycles, temperature and ambient humidity can all affect physiological variables. For example, there are plenty of articles that document alterations in the circadian rhythm and heart rate and blood pressure with alterations in the light dark cycle. It's standard procedure for animal housing facilities to control light dark cycles, usually at a 12 hour light, 12 hour dark schedule, as well as controlling temperature and humidity and some sort of management of airflow and animal dander. What I would urge you to consider carefully is whether that particular housing environment is suitable for telemetry. If you're using a space shed with many other researchers, is there heavy human traffic that can affect behavior of your animal? So for example, our animals are checked at 9.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. each weekday and 9.30 a.m. in the weekends. There's a clear, it's clearly visible that there is a small period of activity seen as an elevation in heart rate during the times when the animals are checked. So if you have different researchers constantly going in and out of the animal rooms each day, what effect does that have on your telemetry recordings? Is this something that may overall affect the results of your experiments? Now the second half of our webinar will look at tips on increasing efficiency when scaling up your telemetry setup. But before we get into that, I'd like to run our second poll to get an idea of what scale um, telemetry that us as a group are running. So I'm just going to start it now. Um, again, I'll leave the polls running for 30 seconds and share the results with everyone. So how many telemetry setups are you currently running? Do you run 1 to 4, 5 to 14, or 15 plus? Or are you not currently running any uh, telemetry experiments? So just over half of you have voted. Um, I will give you another 10 seconds to vote and I'll close the vote and share the results with everyone. So the votes are closing now. And uh, it looks like almost half of you are not doing any telemetry setups right now and um, quite evenly distributed um, the number of setups. We have uh, some running few and some running many. So moving on, scaling up telemetry. So quite often I've seen customer setups where the smart pads are placed on top of lab benches. Now you can fit a maximum of maybe two to four setups depending on how big your lab bench is. If you're looking to scale up your number of telemetry setups, I highly recommend going vertical. So the shelving in this picture here, there's four shelves here on this trolley, 
are made of composite wood or you could use solid wood or plastic shelving. And you can see already that with this one uh, trolley, we can house eight setups in the width of what would be a small lab bench. You can line these shelves up around the walls and you would only need five of these to reach um, the maximum number of setups, 40 channels available. Now my second tip would be to get organized. When you have a lot of setups, it's really easy to put the wrong animal on the wrong smart pad or T-base. Or maybe you won't, but perhaps someone else in the lab might. Now the consequences is that your telemeter runs out of battery or stops working and you have no idea why. Especially with rat telemeters, you may not find out the telemeter has run out of battery. Um, when you have left the lab for the day and you lose data for the whole night. And it takes surprisingly long to actually troubleshoot this. Now to prevent this, you can make sure that the smart pads or the T-base has a label on it which says the channel number, so for example here channel 26, and the animal ID number TRM1702 uh, written on it and I use um, some masking tape that can uh, I can rip off and change whenever I have a new animal. But also make sure that you've got a label on the animal cage lid as well. So when we routinely swap out a clean cage bottom of uh, for the animals, we put the old cage lid back on and the animal ID still matches the animal in the cage. We also put monitoring, monitoring sheets on the left of the cages here. So the third tip is to get tidy. When you grow your number of telemetry setups, it can get chaotic pretty quickly with the number of cables and power packs involved. Have you connected the correct cables to your acquisition hardware? For example, you might get a pretty funny pressure recording if you connected the cable to the temperature output instead. I'll cover this in a couple of slides. So besides from labeling the smart pad and T-bases and the animal cage with the details of the telemetry setup, it's also a really good idea to include that information on your animal monitoring sheet. The advantages of doing that is that when you misplace an animal on a smart pad, you can also use the sheets to tell which telemeters is paired with which smart pads, especially if you've forgotten to update the labels on your animal cage or your hardware. It allows you to track back to which telemeters were implanted and which animal long after the experiments have finished. Why would you want to do that? So, well, for example, if you track offsets on pressure telemeters and if you're adjusting for those, it might be useful. It's not just good practice, but when you have more than one pressure telemeter you use, you'd able to, you would be able to track back and see which animals you may need to adjust pressure offsets on. Now, I would recommend for each animal you record the information of the telemeter serial number, the smart pad serial number, and the channel number they were assigned to, as well as if you're using co-housing, the corresponding telemeter numbers and smart pads that you use um, this particular setup with. So I've put up an example animal monitoring sheet for download in the GoToWebinar software. Have a look, it might give you an idea of how to customize your animal monitoring sheet to include this material. So getting tidy, when you have a lot of setups, BNC cables can be a logistics nightmare. As you can see, there are 120 BNC cables and 40 power pack cables that you need to keep track of when you have 40 telemetry setups. In our labs, we use cable ties to reduce the num uh, the, from the same smart to tie the cables from the same smart bed or T-base together. You can see here in the red circle, we've cable tied these um, cables together. Instantly, that reduces 120 separate BNC cables down to 40 bundles of cables. Now, because our data acquisition hardware and computers are in the adjacent room, the BNC cables in their bundles are passed through the wall through holes here. 
and because we have bundled them we note that each of the three BNC cables in a bundle goes to the same SmartPad or T-Base. Now we also have a labelling system using coloured cable ties which tells me which smart pad or T-Base a particular bunch of cables come from and what is being output from each BNC cable. So for example in this picture below here we've got red, yellow and either red, yellow or green. Um, using our labelling system we can see that the cables come from the red column the yellow shelf, meaning that the cables all belong to this particular smart pad in the setup. Um, and the third colour tells me which output uh, comes that particular cable is conveying. Now you can see that the power packs have also been tied to the side of the shelves. So why tie up the power packs? There's a few reasons. So for example, it prevents them from uh, falling off the back of the trolley which can be quite annoying but sometimes may or may not actually pull out um, the power cable um, into the this T-base here. But it also prevents them from obstructing the air vents out here and by tying them next to the T-base that it's powering we also know that this particular power pack belongs to this T-Base. So when we turn off this particular setup, when it's not being used, we're sure that we're not turning off the wrong piece of hardware. So hopefully these tips inspire you to set up a system for identification of cables and power packs that work for you and your lab. Lastly, data acquisition. We have computers set up that we only use for data acquisition and we refrain from using it for other purposes, especially for data analysis. This is because both data acquisition and analysis uses a lot of memory for the computer and not all data acquisition software saves the data as it's being collected. So if you somehow stall your computer, you may end up losing all the data that you haven't yet saved. Now going back to the animal housing section of the webinar, we recommended that you put in some consideration and whether your animal housing facility is suitable for telemetry studies. Now in our lab we have our data acquisition and computers in the adjacent area to the animal room. So the shelving is actually on the other side of this wall that you see here and this minimizes the foot traffic in and out of the animal room. We also have a UPS or an uninterrupted power supply which keeps the telemetry gear and acquisition computers um, buffered against any sudden short power cuts and keeping the gear powered until the power comes back on. If you experience a short power cut at night, this means you're less likely to come in the next day to find that you've lost data for the whole of the evening. So when you're collecting data from a lot of telemetry setups, naturally you end up with a lot of data. Where do you store that data? How can you access that data? One option can be a network drive. This ensures that the data is still accessible if there's some sort of catastrophic computer hardware, uh, sorry, hard drive failure. It also makes it easy for multiple users to access the same data from remote locations. And network drives can also be backed up by servers to ensure that there is always a copy of your data available. So today I've shown you a few examples of different setups for surgery. They all come with um, pros and cons and you need to find which one suits you. Of course you don't have to stick with one or the other, as the scale of your experiments change, you may want to change the surgery environment to match that. Hopefully I've got you thinking about whether your animal housing environment is suitable for telemetry. Do you share a space and have a lot of human traffic that disturbs the animals? Finally, when scaling up your telemetry setups, remember to go vertical, get organized and get tidy. So that concludes today's presentation. I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Just a reminder that the questions should be typed into the questions panel of the GoToWebinar software. And if your webinar software is hidden, click on this orange uh, button here with the arrow to bring it back into view.
If you think of any more technical or scientific questions after the webinar has concluded, feel free to send us an email on either support at miller.com or webinar at miller.com and myself or a member of the support team would be able to answer any questions you may have. Now uh, bear with me for a moment while I see if we have any questions. So uh, we don't seem to have any questions, um, uh, so I think we might just conclude the webinar. Remember if you have any other questions, really do feel free to um, email us on either of these emails. And there's a lot of resources available on a Miller Knowledge, Knowledge Centre, so you, if you haven't already, uh, um, sorry, you might need to you will need to register for an account which is free um, have a check of what resources we have available and thank you for your time today look forward to seeing you at our next webinar um, on March the 1st on PV loops thank you um.